to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. To the young preacher Timothy, the apostle Paul said, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. 2 Timothy 4, verse number 2. We welcome you to our study of the life and work of a gospel preacher. We encourage you to locate your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to look at this very encouraging study together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at one 855 Four five eight three nine zero five. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. As we examine the life and the work of a gospel preacher... What an awesome privilege it is to proclaim the message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul said, I thank God who enabled me to preach the gospel. 1 Timothy 1, verses 11 through 12. And so it is a privilege and it's an awesome responsibility to proclaim the saving message of Jesus Christ. But what is the life and the work of a gospel preacher all about? And what makes up the qualities of a good minister of Jesus Christ? 1 Timothy 4, verses 12 through 16. We're going to think about those qualities in the life of a gospel preacher today. Again, from the address that Paul gives to the elders in Ephesus as a preacher in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse number 18. Notice the first quality from the life and work of a gospel preacher. Paul says, a gospel preacher first and foremost must live an exemplary life before all people. Listen to Acts 20 verse 18. Paul says of his own life, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. You know, as people thought about Paul and as they thought about his work, as they thought about maybe some of the things he suffered, there's one thing in Asia that Paul says stood out. You know the kind of life I tried to live. Paul's not being haughty. He's not saying he's perfect. He's not saying that he never sinned. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying, I've done my best. I've tried in every way to live as an example for Jesus Christ. And friend, isn't that how every Christian and especially every gospel preacher ought to live. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in faith, in spirit, in purity, in all those things. Paul encourages the young preacher Timothy, be an example in everything you do. Make sure you live an exemplary life 
before the people of God and before the world. Now think about it this way with me. Let's say that Paul had been in Asia. And let's say that Paul hadn't lived like he ought to live. And let's say that he's teaching against immorality or he's teaching against some kind of problem, sin or lying or whatever it may be, drunkenness, lying, whatever it may be. And people in their own mind begin to think, you know, I heard Paul say that, but then I saw something that didn't match up with that. Maybe I saw Paul do something that wasn't honest. Or maybe I saw him involved in some kind of immorality and we hear him preach about it and we hear him talk about it and that's great. But we look at his life and he doesn't even believe that. Now we know Paul didn't do that. But can you imagine the kind of hypocritical impact something like that would have? That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27, I discipline my body. I buffet my body and bring it into subjection. Why? Lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. And so as a gospel preacher, as a Bible class teacher, as a, a one who's working trying to save souls, an evangelist, make sure that your life lines up with what you're teaching. Don't be hypocritical. Really live what you preach and what you teach. And when people see that, they can see the two match up. And you know what they say? They say, he really believes that. We know he does because he's trying his best to live it. A second aspect that relates to the life and work of a gospel preacher mentioned from Paul's address to the elders in Ephesus is this. Gospel preachers have got to consider themselves servants of the Lord. Listen to Acts chapter 20, verse number 19. Paul says this little phrase, serving the Lord with all humility. Now we'll talk about the humility in a moment, but notice he simply identifies that part of his work is serving the Lord. As a minister, as an evangelist, as a Bible class teacher, whatever it may be, you're a servant of the Lord. And friend, no greater work could you have than that. Remember, the first to be last, the last to be first. Those who serve are going to be greatest in the kingdom. There was some bickering and, uh, bickering and uh, complaining among the disciples of Jesus in Mark chapter 10. They're arguing over who's going to be first and who's going to have the chief seat and who's going to sit you know, on the throne in essence. And Jesus said this in Mark chapter 10 verse 45 to show the prime example, premier example. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You know, it's, if we're not careful, it's easy to think that, well, uh, preachers ought to be served. No, that's not the way it ought to be. Preachers are servants. Preachers are ministers of God designed to help God's people, designed to preach the gospel, designed to live the kind of life they ought to live. But first and foremost... Their servants. I want you to listen again to what Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I want you to listen to these words in verse number 12. Paul tells Timothy, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. An example. Let no one despise your youth. Paul, uh, Timothy had some things against him a little bit already. He was young, and people might have wanted to hold that against him. Paul says, let nobody despise your youth. Here's what you need to do. Be an example. An example of what? Service, word, conduct, faith, love, spirit, purity, and all those things. He needed to be the type of servant that God needs. And friend, that's what God wants of me and you. Ultimately, I'm a servant of God. Secondarily, I'm a servant of others as well who are worshiping and trying to serve God and I want to do what I can to help them. You know, sometimes I see people and they want to exalt others, especially maybe some in places of leadership. They want to exalt them and kind of put them on a pedestal. We're servants. We're right down there with everybody else. There's no big me and little you or little me and big you. We all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross and all of us are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody deserves to be exalted over anybody else inside the family and the people of Almighty God. Now, a third quality, and this is directly tied into Acts 20 verse 19, is this. The Apostle Paul, as he talks about his work, says, realizing that we are serving the Lord, Acts 20 verse 19, with all humility. What's the work of a gospel preacher? What's his lifestyle? What are one of the qualities and characteristics he's to possess? 
Well, he's to serve the Lord with all humility of heart, not to be haughty or proud. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. We're not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. As Paul says in Romans chapter 12, rather, we're to serve the Lord with humility. You know, when you think of, of having that humility of heart, we realize that ultimately God's the Creator. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Master and that I simply have the privilege to serve Him. And I do that out of humility. I do that out of humbleness of heart because I know how much God's done for me. I know how much God's done for each one of us. You know, look at what He gave. Look at what He sacrificed. Look at how much He loves us. Look at how He takes care of us every day. And friend, when I look at all that, you know, I feel quite like the psalmist in Psalm chapter 8. You ever feel this way? Don't you sometimes feel like saying, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You know, you talk about an humbling idea. It's the fact that the God who spoke this world into existence, the God who continually provides and cares for his own, has chosen to do that for me and you. And how humbling. It is to know that the God of heaven cares for each one of us and just as humbling as this, to be placed in the position to given the awesome privilege to be a gospel preacher, an evangelist, a mission worker. Friend, you can't have a more humbling experience than that. To know you have the privilege to proclaim the words that have the power to save souls we desperately then need to serve the Lord with humility of heart. Not proudness, not haughtiness, not I'm better than others, no. With humility. Realizing it is an awesome privilege and an awesome responsibility to serve God and to serve others in that capacity. Alright, let's talk a little bit more about the life and work of a gospel preacher. And here's one of the things that Paul will also identify as something preachers have to realize. Realize that in serving God faithfully, you might have to do that. Well, you probably will have to do that in the midst of trials each of us face. Listen to Acts 20 verse 19 again. Serving the Lord with all humility. Now listen to this. With many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. Now, you take yourself and you put yourself in Paul's shoes for just a moment. Paul had been a ringleader of the Jews. He had been one of the Jewish elite, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, great servant of what he thought was God, trying to do what was right, and yet he was living in the wrong way. Jesus confronts him in Acts chapter 9. He makes a 180 degree turn. Now the one who was the persecutor is the one who is the preacher of the message of Jesus Christ. And because of that, the Jews want to kill him. Because of that, they bounce rocks off his head in Acts 14. They beat him. Uh, he's uh, abandoned, shipwrecked. He faced a lot of trials and persecution, even <laughs> imprisoned and goes to Caesar himself. Why? Preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Friend, let's realize that as a gospel preacher, any Christian really, but even for preaching the gospel, it may be the case that we have to face persecution and trials. Now, don't, don't let this catch you off guard, okay? Because God had already promised us that, had He not? 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Here's what Paul said after they had bounced rocks off his head in Acts 14. Paul arose, in essence, dusted himself up, got up, off, got up and said, We must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Acts 14, verse 22. Friend, it is going to be the case. If you stand for truth, certain people are not going to like that. If we stand up against false teaching, people may say things about us that are not true. People may try to uh, do things that are not right. If we stand up against certain moral sins, hey, the immoral world's not going to like that and you've got to know it ahead of time if we oppose things even inside the body of Christ that are not like they ought to be, you're going to ruffle some feathers sometimes. 
But friend, if you're teaching truth, if you're doing it with humility of heart, if you're trying to serve the Lord and stand behind the Word of God, let's realize I know ahead of time as a gospel preacher Serving God faithfully means I've got to do that in the midst of the trials. And, and here's the key idea here. When Paul faced those trials, he didn't throw in the towel. Hey, you know, he was beaten. Paul was, uh, he, he, was all, he was stoned. He didn't die, but he was. He was taken and put in prison multiple occasions. Why? Because he taught the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet in all of that, Paul didn't give up. There could have been moments where Paul felt like throwing in the towel. There, there could have been moments where Paul felt like it was too much. Hey, he may have at times could have felt like Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 20 verse 9 where Jeremiah is put in the dungeon. Jeremiah is beaten and he says to himself, I'm not going to speak about the Word of God anymore. I'm not going to speak in His name anymore. Jeremiah said, His Word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of forbearing it and could not. It couldn't be contained. And friend, you can see that in the life of Paul. And so just make a note ahead of time. Yeah, I'm going to have to suffer. I might have to face some things. There may be trials and persecutions that come from being a servant of the Lord. But friend, that's okay. If that's all I have to do on behalf of my Lord, then I can chalk that up as something good. How do we know that? Do you remember Acts chapter 5, verse 42? Here are Peter and John, and they've been beaten. They've been uh, put in prison for preaching the name of Jesus. They're now let out, and the Bible says, and they counted themselves worthy. To, they counted a joy to suffer in the name of Jesus. And from in every house, and from in the temple, and from house to house, they ceased not teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They counted it a mere joy to suffer for their Lord and God and their teacher and master, Jesus Christ. And so must we today. All right, another principle that relates to the life and work of a gospel preacher is mentioned from Paul in Acts chapter 20, we have got to teach and preach the whole counsel of God. Listen to Acts chapter 20, verse number 20. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. And then he says in Acts 20, verse 27, I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What makes a good gospel preacher? Friend, anybody can stand up and say the things that are popular, the things that are fun to talk about, the things that everybody agrees with. But preaching the whole counsel of God is a lot different. Oh, people may stand behind when we preach on things like prayer and know that we need to pray. And people may stand behind it when we preach on encouraging one another and joy in Christianity and, and things that everybody in the world agrees with. But when we begin to preach against sin, when we begin to preach about immorality, when we preach about ungodliness or false doctrine, and we begin to point out the specifics of that, it may not be quite as easy to preach the whole counsel of God then but that's what's required of us. If I'm going to be a preacher, I can't be a hireling. If I'm going to be a preacher, I can't be a, a, somebody who's just going to say everything that makes it. It's not, we're not talking about a good after-dinner speech, okay? We're talking about the whole counsel of God. Listen again to 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Preach the Word. What do you mean, Paul? Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. You know that phrase, in season, out of season? I believe it was gospel preacher, uh, preacher Marshall Keeble who said it this way. That means when they like it and when they don't like it. Friend, we've got to preach the whole counsel of God regardless of how people may feel or not feel about that. We've got to preach it anyway. You know, you think about the prophets. Isaiah, he wasn't always received well. Ezekiel, wasn't received well. Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, multiple of the minor prophets face severe persecution, but those men are held up as prime examples for us because they preach the whole counsel of God. That's what we must do as well. 1 Peter 4.11 Speak as the oracles of God. Don't say to yourself, you know, I'm going to be the type of preacher that everybody likes me. Woe to you. When all men speak well of you, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, I'm going to be the type of preacher that's popular and nobody ever disagrees with me. That's not possible. You know, you may be popular, 
People may like the preaching of the gospel, but there are going to be times when people may not appreciate the whole, the totality, some things that hit them you know, right in the heart and changes need to be made, and sometimes they take it out on the messenger instead of actually dealing with the message. Now, let's mention this also. Part of the life and work of a gospel preacher is that he has the responsibility to teach God's Word publicly and from house to house. You know, when we think about a preacher, we're not necessarily talking about somebody standing behind a pulpit. That may be part of it, but the work of a preacher is more than wearing uh, what we think of as a suit and tie and standing behind a pulpit uh, twice a week and delivering a 30, 25, 30-minute 30 speech, sermon. It's more than that. Preachers and teachers of God's Word, and all Christians really, need to teach God's Word publicly and from house to house. Listen again to Acts 20, verse 20. Paul says, I have proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Again, we're reminded of the example. Acts chapter 5, verse number 42. They counted themselves worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. And daily in the temple, there's publicly, and from house to house, they cease not preaching and teaching Jesus as the Christ. Friend, don't get me wrong. I believe in the power of the spoken word of God at any time. But sometimes, not always, but sometimes the most effective work you can do is sitting across the table from somebody on a one-on-one -on -one level and studying the Bible, opening up the Scriptures, talking about the message of Jesus, and trying to make practical application right there in a one-on-one -on -one setting. We see multiple conversions throughout the New Testament that happen just that way. And so let's not think to ourselves, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm going to have a big library. I'm going to have an office. I'm going to sit in there all week and I'm going to prepare sermons. I'm going to teach Bible class. That may be part of it. But let's realize, outside the walls of that office and many times outside the walls of the Lord's church, the building anyway, there's a whole world that desperately needs to be saved. They may not want to. Some of them may not do it. But I've got the responsibility, the privilege of trying to do just that. Another aspect in the life and work of a gospel preacher is that he has the responsibility to preach and teach God's plan of salvation to all people. Listen to Acts 20, verse 21. As part of Paul's work, both publicly and from house to house, he says this, testifying to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. What is it Paul is proclaiming here? The gospel plan of salvation. Friend, there's a whole lot of things we could preach, but if we never get down to the nitty-gritty, if we never get down to the real nuts and bolts of it, we're not teaching the gospel plan of salvation like we ought to. You know, I've heard a lot of, I've heard a lot of good sermons, but I've heard some that fell short of telling people exactly what they needed to do to get their life right with God. I understand that may not be the case, that every sermon that can work out that way, but you can surely try. You can surely try, especially when there are people in the audience who've never heard about the plan of salvation. We sure want to try to work that in to God's message. And so we want to try to preach the gospel as far and as wide as we can. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? It's the power of God and salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, Go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature. Friend, as we think about God's message of salvation, as we think about that plan of salvation, what a wonderful plan it is. Have you thought about how much our God loves you? How deeply He loves you? The Bible says, listen to this, God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. That's how much God loves you and me. So much so, He sent His Son to die so that we could have the hope of eternal life. He Himself, Jesus Himself, bore our sins in His own body upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 24. Friend, we ask you today, have you taken advantage of the salvation that Jesus has made available? When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper in the passing of the fruit of the vine, He said this to His disciples. He said, This is My blood 
of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Have you had your sins forgiven? If not, then friend, the Bible clearly teaches exactly how to do that. On the great day of Pentecost, they heard about Jesus as the Messiah. Then they were taught what to do to make that right. Peter said in Acts 2 verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. To people who heard it, believed in the message, no doubt acknowledged Jesus as Savior, they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Friend, we encourage you today to do exactly the same thing they did in the New Testament. If you're not a child of God, we want you to know how much God loves you. We want you to know that, that God has a way to save you. That way is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Maybe there are things that are keeping you from doing that. Friend, whatever those things are. Maybe it's, maybe it's some problem you're dealing with. Maybe it's, maybe it's some family issue you're struggling with. Friend, I promise you, you'll find more help when you become a Christian, when you decide to change your life in Christ than you'd ever have outside of Him. Help is offered to God's people. And if there are things that are keeping you from obeying the gospel, we're urging you today, get those things out of the way, whatever it may be, so that your life can be right with God. Listen carefully. Jesus made the great promise in Matthew 11, verse 28. And what an encouraging promise it is. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Friend, have you come to Christ to have those burdens relieved? Have you really found that rest that Jesus wants to offer? If not, our plea is very simple. We're begging you in view of the love of God, in view of the brevity of life. Won't you become a child of God? If you've never done that and you'd like to study more, you'd like to talk about it, we'd love to help you with that. But whatever your need is, we beg you to make it right while we have time and while we have opportunity. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.